Hey, Bulldogs. So before we broke for this coronavirus emergency, we were wrapping up the French Revolution. You were doing your Cornell notes, which I know we didn't get to do the culmination of what that was for, but I did also promise you a day to learn about the history of the guillotine. Now, of course, it'd be much more fun to learn about it in class and where I could uh, show you things like Remember this, um, that a student welded for me once a guillotine and maybe like have pretend heads pop off, right? Um, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. And at least the first video you need to see over break is a little bit more interesting, um, juicy, even if it is messed up than compared to some of the other more um, content-based videos you'll have like on the Haitian Revolution coming up. Still worth learning about, right? Just not as... Um, crazy is learning about this. So um, to get us sort of back in the swing of things, I made this video on the history of the guillotine. So just a little bit about um, its specs first. Um, the guillotine itself, um, its blade is 88.2 pounds. The height of the guillotine was about 14 feet. The falling blade of the guillotine had a rate of about 21 feet per second, and the actual beheading took only about two one-hundredths of a second. Um, the time it took for the guillotine blade to fall to where it stops takes a 70th of a second. So it all happened very quickly. Um, and if you want to know, the weight of the guillotine was about 1,278 pounds. Um, so a little bit about the history of the guillotine. Now, the idea of a guillotine goes back way before the actual guillotine. Um, unfortunately, people were beheading each other for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years at this point. And there was a device being used in other parts of the world, even back to medieval times. It just wasn't quite as efficient, if that's the word to use, as the guillotine. Now, through medieval times, when beheading was more common, um, usually it was done with, say, an axe or even a sword. Um, Sometimes, though, it would not go through the person's neck in one chop. So you can imagine that being painful. Um, and sometimes the uh, blade was not very dull. In fact, I may have mentioned like when Anne Boleyn was beheaded, the king brought in the good executioner over from France and made sure the blade was sharpened because they know sometimes it just was not so quick. So this is a man, Dr. Joseph Ignis, Ignis Gillette like without the E, guillotin, right? Just, and um, he proposed that the French government needed a gentler way to kill people. Remember, this is the, uh, the Enlightenment and we're worried about everyone has rights and we need to be humane. So even killing people, we have to do so more kindly. He himself was actually opposed to the death penalty, um, but he said if you had a lightning quick machine, it would be more humane and ego egalitarian. So like regardless if you were um, poor or rich, you didn't have to worry about like someone sharpening the blade. You'd all be killed in the same way. Um, because some of those axe beheadings were just botched a little bit, did not go to right. So he later helped to oversee the first prototype of what we now know as the guillotine. Um, it was actually built by a German harpsichord um, maker whose name was Tobias Smith, right? He thought, hey, this is cruel. We need to find a better way. This axing is not working. Tobias Smith actually made harpsichords, which are instruments. So imagine normally building instruments and then building like, like whoever built, you know, the, the electric chair probably was not making pianos, you know? Um, so by 1792, that spring in April, um, the guillotine had its first victim, so to speak. And Guillotine himself was sort of like, oh, he was not happy about it because he was against a death penalty, but like at least if you had to have one, it was not so bad. He tried to distance himself from um, the guillotine and actually tried to change his last name, um, but the government would not let him because he and but the E is added on. That is one little difference um, between that. Um, any more about him? Um, we already learned about ways people were killed often before then. We learned about um, the man who was broken on the wheel that Voltaire wrote about um, and all the, those sorts of things. Um, now, who would behead them? Someone still had to drop that rope to make the blade 
fall down. So you still need an executioner. You need still need someone who has to be in charge of letting that blade go. And I want to tell you a little bit about this man, um, Sanson, Charles Henri Sanson. And he was the chief executioner to both um, King Louis here during this regime um, and also through the revolution. Now, um, at the start of the revolution, he was people were like, oh, we don't like him because he's like a hand of the king. But by the end of the revolution, he ended his life known as the Great Sanson. Now, this was like a family job for him. Um, he had his great grandfather, who was an executioner, who was actually coerced to take that job when his father-in-law, who was also the chief executioner, passed away. And then over the next century, three other Sanson men in the family had the role of chief executioner. Um, so that's, that's something worth noting. Um, now, when he became chief executioner, Sanson was only 39 years old. But here's a little side note. When his father had a really bad illness in 1754, Charles Henry took over his duties for him. So he was actually on the scaffold getting people beheaded at the age of 15, right? That's not much older than you guys. Can you imagine like your job next year is to be a head executioner, right? Um, and as a boy, they're like, wow, he's a really good executioner. He has wisdom way beyond his years. He has a stomach strong enough to handle all these things because before the guillotine, there were some nasty ways people were killed, strangulations, beheadings, burnings. And they said, hey, he seems to hold, be able to handle all this. Well, he was still a teenager. Um, he dealt with, at this age of 15, he dealt with this example of um, drawing and quartering, uh, where people were being you know, pulled by, by all ends. Um, and he looked back at this time. Um, he's like, wow, things are getting easier now. I just got to drop a blade on. So, I mean, that's something. Um, what else do we want to know about it? Well, let's hear about what I guess actually um, some of the truths, uh, the numbers here. How many people were killed by the guillotine? Um, in Paris, 2,639 people were guillotined. Now we all know that many, many more people were killed during the French Revolution than that. Um, uh, upwards of 50,000 people were shot. Many of them died of sicknesses while they were in the prisons. About a quarter of a million people died in the civil war that broke out from the revolution. Um, others were um, put onto boats and drowned. I think we learned about that in the French Revolution um, videos. But there were still thousands that were killed by guillotine. So why a lot of you guys were, were asking questions was about consciousness. Just how conscious um, do you sometimes remain if you're uh, a guillotine? So I'm going to tell you uh, some stories. So here's the story of Charlotte Corday. Now, we learned about Charlotte Corday in our videos that she killed Marat. She was um, had her head severed, and the executioner smacked the cheeks of her head and held it in front of the people. And to the astonishment of the crowd, her, her cheeks flushed and her face changed to show like unequ unequivocal marks of indignation. Um, so that was like, oh, maybe, maybe she's conscious. So, um, you know, people started questioning, were they, were they people conscious? So people would do experiments. They would like light, take candles and put them in front of their face and snap their fingers in front of their eyes. And then they were like, you know what? We, we can't do that. That's, that's torture. Their heads are just chopped off. We should not do experiments on them. The scientific revolution happened and we think that's not good. But think about it. Um, we know that chickens, they often walk around for several seconds after their heads are chopped off. Um, there was a Dutch rat study and it suggested that rats' heads, um, after they're chopped off, that they're conscious for four seconds. And if you think four seconds isn't long, after your head's chopped off, think one, two, three, four, and all that you might hear from the crowd or even see your body in those four seconds. Um, there's also this case of um, Dr. Barreau and Langui. So the most famous case uh, is from this. And Barreau had an experiment. Now this is many years later. This is, as you see, it's a photo, right? Jan June 28th of 1905. And the body part of Langui um, was reported in this medical journal. So um, 
let's see how we should read this story. I have um, so he he had him decapitated, and he wrote the head fell on the severed surface of the neck, and I did not therefore have to take it up in my hands, as all the newspapers have viewed with each other in repeating. Here then is what I will was able to note immediately after the decapitation. The eyelids and lips of the guillotine man worked in rhythmic um, contractions for about five or six seconds. I waited for several seconds. The spasmodic movement ceased. The face relaxed. The lids half closed on the eyeballs, leaving only the white visible, exactly as in the dying whom we have an occasion to see every other day in the exercise of our profession, or as in those just dead. It was then that I called in a strong, sharp voice, Langui! I saw the eyelids slowly lift up without any spasmodic contractions. Dr. Burrow compared the glare that Langui gave him with people aw awakened or torn from their thoughts. He continued, Next, Langui's eyes very definitely fixed themselves on mine, and the pupils focused themselves. I was not then dealing with the sort of vague, dull look without any expression that can be observed any day in dying people to whom one speaks. I was dealing with the undeniably living eyes, which were looking at me. Barreau called his name out a second time, Langui, and again Langui's eyes fixed on his. He added, the eyelids lifted, and undeniably living eyes fixed themselves on mine, with perhaps even more penetration than the first time. The doctor then called out a third time, but this time Langui was most certainly dead, and did not respond. He said, the whole thing had lasted 25 to 30 seconds. So think about that, right? The, the can you imagine eyes meeting and, and staring into yours. Um, there were some other cases before then, um, you know, in the 1800s where they did try to test um, consciousness. Um, there was a man who's, um, who murdered someone. It's a whole, there's a whole story there, um, but they, sort of did tests on it, but his head was like 30 minutes later. So like you need, you can't test 30 minutes later. Um, there's another case in 1880 where they tried to see if they could keep the man conscious by ready, pumping the blood of a living dog through the person. Um, and they recorded that the lips swelled and colored visibly and looked like the head was about to speak. And then it twitched. Um, this was um eventually they said you know what this is like a moral illegal we can't test people like that but if you look up you want to look it up about the case in 1880 uh louise menishu it's um i mean the man did some pretty criminal things but what they did to his body afterwards is pretty creepy too the dog however you know was fine um the last guillotine execution um was actually the last execution of any type in France, we did mention that most Western countries, you know, Europe uh, has abolished the death penalty. We're the only somewhat, you know, considered Western country that still has a death penalty on its books. Um, so this was September 10th, 1977. Um, it was in Marseille in France. And the murderer was um, Hamida, to, oh, that is picture, to Dondobi. I may be saying that incorrectly, but you can look it up. September 1977 was the last execution in, in France. Um, so uh, they never got to do like lethal injection because it was already gone before that became a thing. Um, I will say that by the 1950s, a government study um, by two doctors, Poilivier and Fournier concluded that death by guillotine is not instantaneous. So whether it lasts a second, four seconds, 30 seconds, some suggested up to two minutes, who knows? Um, now, of course, there's also debate today on is lethal injection still even um, considered humane? Um, there's been examples where it does not happen right away and where people do seem to be in pain before it goes, um, especially now since many European countries do not want to sell us drugs that they know that we're using for the death penalty. So trying to establish new drugs in America has resulted in the lethal injection not always going so so smoothly, so to speak. Um, I added a few links on the document for your assignment, which you do not have to read. Um, you may want to, it does go into that as well. Um, you can also look up further things. Um, I just, it's just two links I gave you. One is the pro and cons 
And one is a recent article from NPR. Um, if you want more readings on any of this, um, I can try to lead you into the right direction. Uh, just let me know. Um, you don't need to do a Google form for this video. Um, it's just uh, those questions that relate to the death penalty and vicaria, where you want to also bring in some information from this video the best you can. All right, miss you guys, um, and uh, do your best work. I know, I know you'll do awesome.